So I think without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce Maggie Shawcross, who is the Adult Services Librarian for the High Plains Library District. And Maggie, I'm going to go ahead and pull up your slides and uh, let you take it away. All right, well, thank you so much, Christine. So my name is Maggie Shawcross. And as Christine mentioned, I am an adult services librarian with the High Plains Library District. Thank you so much for joining me today um, as we talk about health and health literacy in libraries. Um, so I am part of the High Plains Library District and I'm at the Riverside Library and Cultural Center in Evans, Colorado. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about collaborating with local health organizations to address health disparities in your community. See if I can. Okay, let me forward this slide a little. Yay, there we go. So um, today, uh, with the presentation, I would like you to leave this presentation with three major objectives. The first one, I want you to know what health disparities are. Um, and in recognizing what health disparities are, then you can have some ideas for programming. And I wanted to share some programming ideas that we have done at my library with community partners. And then we're going to wrap things up talking about online resources that are not Google that you can connect your patrons to. Um, so we're going to start talking about public health in libraries. So it's it's not the most sexy of topics, um, but I think it's very, very important. So I want to make sure to share it with you. And I want to try to keep this a little bit interactive. So um, I'm going to start with a question here. Ooh. And Christine, it skipped a couple. Let's see, hold on one second. Is this where we wanted the poll? Yes. Yay, thank you so much. Um, so just to kind of get a little interaction, what are your thoughts about health in libraries? Do you think it's just fabulous, it's great, you're ready and excited to do more? Um, you'd like to help, but don't see yourself as a health expert. Um, you're worried and you don't want to even touch that. Uh, do you feel that it's not our place, that we have health departments, hospitals, clinics to address those needs, or you never really thought about it? So if you can take a moment and give us your vote. Right. So for those of you who think it's great and you're excited and ready to do more, thank you so much for being here. I hope to give you some ideas. Um, for those of you who've never really thought about it, Thank you for keeping an open mind. Um, and these are the four major school of thoughts when it comes to health and libraries. You know, people are excited about it. Um, they never really thought about it. Um, for those of you who would like to help, but you're not a health expert, just know that you will be connecting your patrons to those health experts. So you don't really have to be the health expert. And for those of you who don't think it's our place, um, I wanted to share a couple thoughts with you. So, Christine, so next slide, we'll end the poll. Thank you so much. So why should libraries care about health uh, or the health of our patrons? So libraries are safe spaces to access information. They are trusted places. I want our patrons to come to libraries to access that information. Libraries are also the first point of access for many community resources, and I'm hoping that through you all connecting with those community resources, you will learn about them and then be able to, um, to tell your patrons about them and connect them. And libraries tend to serve high-risk populations, children, older adults, teens, people who are experiencing homelessness, lower income patrons, and those are some of the patrons that some of the public health entities that are out there are trying to connect with as well. So we make natural partners. And for me, one that I left out that I was just thinking about is that our patrons are asking for this type of programming. They're also coming into our libraries and asking us those questions. Um, so there is is a really good article by the Nation's Health. It's a publication based out of, out of the American Public Health Association that says that people are more likely to visit their library than their doctor. And so health advocates have a great opportunity to reach out to patrons where they're at. And we are just key points of service in the community and 
we want to help our community members. So now I hope that I have you excited about public health. You're so excited to get started. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit more. So I'm taking you back to Psych 101. Um, for those of us who went through library school, we learned about theories and models to help us explain the behavior of people and why they do certain things. So I want to talk to you about two major uh, theories or models that we use to talk about uh, beha health behavior and as it pertains to libraries. So the first one we're going to start off with is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs. So how many of you have heard of Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs? And you can raise your little hand or say yes in the chat box. And if you want to raise your hand, it's in the, yep, people are finding it. Upper. Um, so Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, um, as I mentioned, it's it's talked about a lot in Psych 101, but even if you haven't heard of it, you are applying it in your library if you're dealing with social issues. And I will explain to you a little bit more um, how that is. So Maslow, um, he theorized that everybody has needs. And in order for someone to fulfill um, themselves to be the best of the best to reach their true self, they have to have certain needs met. So we begin at the bottom. So he theorized this as a pyramid with the base of the pyramid being the most essential, um, the most important. And then um, as we go up, um, it's just, it's not as essential, but it's very important in how we develop as a person. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we have physiological needs. So we have our food and water and shelter, clothing, warmth, sleep. So as long as we meet those first set of needs, we can move on to our next set of needs. So our next set of needs are safety needs. Those are personal security, employment. Um, we have law and order. You are not going home in fear, and only when you have met those needs can you move on to the next set of needs, which is love and belonging. So this is where we form friendships, where we get a sense of family and a sense of community. And only after you have fulfilled most of those needs can you move up to esteem. So in esteem, we have respect, self-esteem status. Um, this is, we, we feel good about ourselves, we are supporting ourselves and one another. And then after most of those needs are met, we move up to self-actualization, which is we are, uh, we have most of our needs met and we can really be our true potential. So why is this important to libraries? So I am reminded that we need to be mindful and we need to be compassionate of our patrons that we serve every day. If we have patrons coming in um, who, who have not eaten, for example, a child has not eaten, they come to our story time, they really cannot pay attention. They can't fulfill that, that big need. If we have somebody destroying property at the library, are they really feeling a sense of belonging as part of the library since they're moving often? We don't. So that's how we see it in libraries. And with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we move on to the next theory, which is the social determinants of health. So the social determinants of health theory was highly influenced by Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So um, with the social determinants of health theory, the Department of Health and Human Services put out this great report called Healthy People 2020. So they were seeing that people were actually getting more sick, that they were more unhealthy than they were in the past, and they wanted to uh, figure out why that was. And they came up with this theory here. And out of this theory came out um, health disparities, which I will touch on in a second. So with social determinants of health, we're looking at five factors that all affect one another. And very much like Maslow, these five factors have to be met in order for somebody to, to have optimal health. So those factors are, let's see if we do neighborhood and built environment. So that includes, um, you know, walkable sidewalks, access to quality housing, environmental conditions, crime and violence. 
The next one is health and healthcare. So we have access to healthcare, access to primary care. If you're out living in a rural community, community do you really have access to a hospital that's nearby? And health literacy. Another one is social and community context. So this is civic participation. Um, is there discrimination in your community? Do you feel like you're safe in your community and can access those services? Incarceration, um, how you feel as a community. We have education, and this could be access to preschools. It could be high school graduation rates. It could be your, uh, your um, access to language. Are you an English speaker? Are you a Spanish speaker? Do you have access to those uh, materials? And then lastly, we have economic stability, employment, food security, housing instability, so poverty. So all these three things play upon one another. And so with that comes the term health disparities. So um, health people were seeing that certain groups of people were experiencing larger amounts of certain con health conditions. So just to read it all out, so we have health disparities refers to the differences in health status of different groups. Some groups of people have higher rates of certain diseases, more deaths and suffering from them compared to others. These groups may be based on race, ethnicity, immigration status, disability, sex or gender, sexual orientation, geography or income. Um, and I require a lot of explanation. I remember learning this and I was like, so tell me what, to, give me some examples. So we know that there are higher rates of heart disease in African Americans. Why is that? We need to look at those social determinants of health. Um, we also know that there are higher rates of tobacco use in LGBT communities. Why is that? We need to look into that. So that is health disparities. So I like to give the example, as I told you, I like things really made clear. So I have a tale of two diabetics. So they are both uh, diagnosed with diabetes. So in the old days before Healthy People 2020, people were given the diagnosis of a diabetes and they were sent home, they were told, lose weight, take some medicine, um, exercise and come see me in six months to a year. And people weren't getting better. So now if we start looking at those factors that affect people, we can start addressing the issue. So here we have a 68 year old female living off social security, mostly Spanish speaking. She has Medicare, doesn't drive. She has one pet that she walks around the neighborhood, but only during the day because she's scared of going out at night. Then we have a 75 year old male. He's living off his pension. He's a little more comfortable. Um, he's an English speaker with some college and he has Medicare, supplemental medical insurance, and he likes to walk around the park. He likes to drive. And so we have these two representative people, these people in our community. So how do we address their health needs in the library? So let's look at them as people who happen to be diabetic and we can start thinking about how to um, how to address those needs. So she might prefer a class in Spanish, right? Um, she would prefer class during the day as she does not drive and she can benefit from disease management because she went to her doctor and she didn't completely understand what the doctor was saying. He might prefer a class in English. He doesn't really need remedial classes on disease management. He knows how to read his medical material that his doctor gave him. But he can also drive and distance isn't an issue and he can do classes at night. So now we're starting to think about how we can program and how we can start addressing those needs. Okay. So we're really moving ourselves in the library field to whole person librarianship, just like um, the medical field is moving to looking at a person as a whole person. We want to look at our patrons as a whole person. So where can you find information about your community? So a great place to get started is to go to the census website, factfinder.census.gov. It's a great website that'll give you an idea of how old your patrons are, um, the languages that they speak, um, the diversity within um, your community, and also um, 
income levels. And this is important because a lot of the health organizations I'll be talking about, they actually will seek out to work with certain communities that are in certain census tracts based on income. So keep that in mind. You can also search for health issues in your county and community. So um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation creates these really great, um, these really great reports called County Health Rankings and Roadmaps for lots of communities. There's also hospital community needs assessments. So hospitals in your area, they have to meet criteria so that they, they can be recertified every year and their foundations have to do community needs assessments. So right there, they can give you tons of information about your own community. There's statewide surveys. So here in Colorado, um, we do a healthy kids survey and it gives us so much information about the teens in our area. And here in Weld County, um, we do a three-year community health survey, which again touches on the needs of our community. And of course you can Google. So this you can Google. You can Google community health assessment and the name of your town and you should get some hits. And of course you could talk to your patrons or your patrons will talk to you and tell you all about what's going on with their health. So here, and we had, um, Christine, we had asked uh, people to give us an idea of what health conditions are appearing in their community. Thank you. So um, participants, what are some health conditions that you are aware of in your community? And you can either use the chat box in the bottom left hand corner or the chat box in the middle um, if you have any ideas of um, maybe health concerns that are happening in your community. And of course, if you haven't thought of it, just so you know, heart disease um, is pretty prevalent. Uh, obesity, mm -hmm. Thanks, diabetes. Amy. And people, unfortunately, don't think of, but mental health, um, depression, right? motor vehicle accidents, texting while driving. There's a lot of health conditions that, that really we need to address. Predictions. Got several people typing. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And Amy mentioned child childhood obesity and addictions. Yes, and it's very sad to me. I've heard that the trend is now that we that the current generation is going to live older than the the current generation coming up with childhood obesity. So thank you everyone. So, um, and Andrea mentioned substance abuse and exposure as well. Thank you. Thanks guys. All right. So now to talk to you about community connections. So I like to give a disclaimer. So any reference in this presentation to any person or organization or activity, product or service related to such person or organization, another business or organization does not constitute or imply an endorsement, recommendation or favoring by my employer. So our lawyers want us to make sure we say that. So I'm just going to give you an idea of different health organizations and some of these are businesses, retail businesses that that I have used and of course I'm not saying that one is better than another. Okay, so hospitals and clinics. Um, so hospitals are a great resource and most communities have a hospital um, that's nearby them with exception to very tiny rural communities and even those rural communities might share one hospital to several counties but just connect with the hospital that is um, that that your patrons use. Um, hospitals have health professionals that would love to connect with you. They have doctors and specialists, therapists. Um, a lot of hospitals, especially the bigger ones, have community wellness departments and those community wellness departments, um, they want to go out to the community, they want to reach patrons. Of course they're doing it in part to advertise their services um, but I'm all about getting that health information to our patrons. 
Um, next we have clinics um, and I wanted to explain the difference between commun community health clinics versus private clinics. So community health clinics are clinics that get most of their funding um, through federal funding and some state funding and private clinics are clinics that mostly uh, work with people who have insurance. So definitely community health clinics are trying to reach to uh, they're trying to reach out to low-income clients so they are a great organization to connect with but even private clinics private clinics are oftentimes recruiting new physicians and wanting to put those physicians out in the community so that people can come to their clinic um, community health centers, some of them are very large, so we're very lucky here in Weld County that we have two large community health clinic systems. We have Salud and we have Sunrise Community Health, and even within those systems, they have community health departments where they try to do community health outreach and health promotion. We have dental clinics. So we have reached out to dental clinics. Um, they have provided us with toothbrushes to give out at story times and they have sent um, they have sent their hygienists to come in and talk to kids about um, good dental health. And behavioral health clinics are also um, great clinics to get connected with. So some of the examples of the cooking of, of the programs that we have done with um, clinics and hospitals include cooking classes and people come in for cooking classes. With the hospital it was a pay but with the clinics it was free. We've done a slow cooker class. So this is a good class to do if you don't have access to a kitchen which a lot of us don't working in libraries. We've done cooking for one, we've done healthy soups, we've done healthy Super Bowl snacks. Um, we worked with a mental health facilitator to do marijuana prevention for teens and then a, a presentation for parents on how to talk to teens about marijuana. We've done a truck petting zoo. So truck petting zoos are awesome. If you're looking for a very, very large program that's going to get, get a lot of interest and it's free, um, but it's a lot of work, um, you should do a truck petting zoo. So a truck petting zoo is where we connected with community organizations. So we invited the hospital and they brought an ambulance. We talked to um, the fire department and they brought a fire engine, even a trash truck. That's part of health. All the you know different trucks, we had them park in the parking lot, and then community members came in and spoke to those representatives from the different organizations. So truck petting zoos are pretty cool. Um, we've done summer reading programs with some of our health organizations. So we've done healthy snacks. Um, one hospital system that I didn't talk about was UC Health. So UC Health is huge and it's very large here in Colorado, and they have a healthy kids club department out of their community wellness department and they have a smoothie bike that they brought out and we did a program on healthy kids snacks and we made smoothies using the smoothie bike. Um, we have worked with Banner Health as well so Banner is another system here in Greeley and we talked to their they have a little library and they have an archive and they let us borrow antique medical equipment that we, we put out on display that was very cool as well. Um, Kaiser Permanente is a great uh, community partner. They have way in win stations. Um, way in way stations are these um, scales that people log into and it measures weight loss and they can get um, prizes for losing weight. And that does come at a cost, but Kaiser has grants to help you pay or offset the cost of those weigh and win stations if you're interested. They also have an um, educational theater department that does health promotion. And then we had dental story times like I had told you with our dental clinics. Now we're going to talk about county and state government. So the county and state government is my little I think they're the gem of the health world and not a lot of people access them or people don't access them as much as they should. So every county in Colorado has a county health department. Some counties share one health department. Um, but with our health departments, health departments have 10 essential services that they must 
provide um, the people in their community and one of those is community health education. So some counties are very very smart um, and they apply for additional funding through state and through private entities and so every county looks different. Our county here, uh, some of their departments within the health department receive county funding. So we live in Weld County, which is considered a pretty conservative county, and our county um, actually pays for abstinence education. And that abstinence education has self-esteem education that's really good for teens, for example. So they are always happy to come out to the library and talk to people or to teens about self-esteem. But our health department here in Wells County also has um, a tobacco grant, so they do tobacco cessation um, classes. They also have a heart healthy grant, where, so they've done uh, mini health fairs for us. Um, they have mental health initiatives, they have uh, walkable sidewalk initiatives, so connect with your health department. Within the county itself, there's also the health, um, health and Human Services Department. So this is where you're going to find your Area Agency on Aging. So this is a department that is uh, focused on assisting older adults. We also have Workforce Development, so getting a job and having a job is part of being healthy, and so they do job services. We also have WIC. So WIC stands for Women, Infants, and Children, and their goal is to um, provide mothers and children with um, healthy food. So they have been an awesome partner. And the Extension Office, another little hidden gem. Um, the Extension Office um, here in, well, most counties should have access to an extension office and extension offices are based out of a college and their whole goal is to connect patrons or connect uh, community members with information from um, universities or colleges. So here in Weld County we have a family and consumer science agent who does cooking classes, canning classes. We also have someone who does, um, we have people who are focused on older adults, we have people who are focused on lawns and forestry and horticulture, so check out your extension office. So with that we move on to the State Health Department. And so I bring up the State Health Department because the State Health Department here in Colorado has come up with the Community Health Improvement Plan. So if you're here in Colorado, I'm not sure about um, different states, but here in Colorado our, um, our government has put together a statute that said that all health departments need a community health improvement plan that needs to be reviewed every five years. So what does this mean to us? Well, it does differ from county to county, but basically every county health department needs to bring together all stakeholders in the community and together they come up with a plan to improve the health of their community. So if you want a meeting that happens at a county level that includes all your your community partners that that have something to do with health you need to get involved with your local community health improvement plan so here in Weld County we have said that mental health healthy eating and active living are our three main goals so at least once a quarter and then there's subcommittees every other month. We meet and we discuss these issues and I connect with um, organizations that are doing this type of health programming and it's been just the best for finding presenters for our programs. Okay, so some of the programs that we have done through the health department and the, the state and county government have been, the health department has done cooking classes. Um, we've done many health fairs and we've done heart healthy cooking. Human service, um, human services, the Area Agency on Aging has done some awesome programs on Tai Chi, chronic disease management and fall prevention. And we've worked with the Workforce Center. Um, they haven't done any classes, but we cross promote. They know about the services that we have to offer for job seekers and they send people over here. WIC has been really awesome. They promote our summer reading, so they'll take giant stacks 
of our material and promoted to all their moms and we promote their services at story times and then we have the extension office the extension office again an awesome resource um, they have a supplemental nutrition um, program which is food stamps but they have an educator that all they do is do health education to lower income clients they have a master gardener program so if you want to have somebody come in and talk about gardening and healthy eating bring them in family consumer science agent and they've done stem programming for us here at the library and they are going to be doing a class in july both the master gardener agent the horticulture agent and the family and consumer science agent are doing a class on growing herbs and then preserving them and then using those herbs to do healthy cooking so it's been great all around oh and i forgot to mention so all these programs that i have mentioned with exception to the hospital have been free okay now we have health organizations so health organizations um, have been awesome their goal is um, to combat certain things so we have american cancer combating cancer world food bank combating um, people who are hungry so we've worked with these different organizations to do different types of programs. So let me get to this one here. So some of the programs that we have done with them, um, we have done the food bank. They've done healthy eating on a budget. The North Colorado Health Alliance has done healthy eating, and they've also been really great at assisting us with large events. So if you ever have a large event, an end of the year party, um, they've come and they've done healthy trail mix stations. They've done obstacle courses for us. Um, we've worked with American Lung Cancer and Diabetes to do health information and health um, and get display material as well. So you don't necessarily have to have them for programming, but they're great resources for material as well. Okay. And now talking to you to, about retail. Um, so did you know that King Supers has a dietitian that will do grocery store tours or will come to your location to do presentations on healthy eating? Um, so we have, and they've been a great partner, they have also provided us with gift cards for programs, um, and they've also worked with us, um, they've done presentations and tours, I work with adults with developmental disabilities, and they've given us a store tour, and we've talked about healthy eating, so just a great partner. Um, we've also worked with martial arts studios, dance studios, um, my hope for the future, I've put others, um, I'd love to work with a gym or running stores. So some of the programs that we have done um, with these um, organizations have been, uh, we've done some dance programs. Um, we've done a Discover Martial Arts program with that martial arts studio. Um, Natural Grocers has also been a good partner to us. They did, for summer reading, they did a Discover Your Dosha program, Discover the Benefits of Chocolate and Smoothie Making. Um, and we've also brought in um, people who do exercise. So we've paid for somebody to do yoga. Um, we did a salsa and salsas program where we talked about health, making healthy salsas and then dancing to salsa. And then we have brought in somebody to teach Zumba Gold to older adults. And again, on-site tours of the grocery store. So we've taken our patrons off-site and done programs with them with um, King Supers um, and again another great resource okay so now just to keep you awake so um, do you currently offer some type of health programming at your library so if you can use the chat box to share Oh, so music and movement for families. So we have culinary, fall prevention, brain games, uh, fitness classes, cardio kickboxing, chair exercise, yoga and meditation, beginner Zumba. Yeah, and one thing that I didn't, um, I didn't state as you type here. So I have had people and I have had supervisors say, there, you should not be providing this type of programming, 
but this is what our patrons are asking for. So, and it brings in people. Oh my gosh, so pajama story time for families, stress management. And this is Christine. I'd also be curious to know like what organizations you all have partnered with. I know when I was talking to Maggie about this session, I had no idea um, that King Supers offered um, a nutritionist or those kinds of things. So you can add those, um, maybe some of your partners. Right, so it's it's great to bring personal trainers, yeah. Yes. Okay, so now we're going to stretch. So, and I did this presentation at CalCon, so it, was, it wasn't so weird, but if you want to, you stand up, stretch those arms high, touch your toes so you don't fall asleep, stretch it out. All right, so now we're going to move on to online health resources. Okay. So look at me, I love to give disclaimers. So when it comes to health programming as well as health information, I like to tell people that there are five things that you need to keep in mind to evaluate whether something's reliable and accurate. And we are librarians, we want to give people the right information. And so these are the things that you need to look for. The first thing you need to look at is currency. What is the timeline of this information? When was it published? When was it last revised? Sometimes with health information, it doesn't get updated as often as you would like. So I used to be at a consumer health library and the, you know, the newest book on fibromyalgia was like 15 years old, but that was the newest book. So just be aware of those types of things. But sometimes you go on a website and it hasn't been updated since 2000. So it's probably not the best information out there. So keep that in mind. The next thing is relevancy. So how relevant is it to your needs? Is it really answering what you're looking to answer? Um, authority, who wrote it? Are they a, rel a reliable source? Is it somebody who's trying to make a profit or is it somebody who's sharing their research that they've done for 10 years? How accurate is it? Um, is the information that they're stating credible? Um, is, is the language that they're using seem to be biased and free of emotion? Um, how accurate is also, you can tell a lot by a website, is the website all written all wrong and not very professional looking? And then lastly, the purpose. And for me, this is the most important thing. Um, why are they writing this article? Um, what is their purpose for sharing this information? Why are they wanting to teach it? Are they selling? Are they entertaining? Are they trying to persuade you? Are they trying to get you to buy something? So keep all these things in mind as I talk to you about some of these health resources. Okay, so it wouldn't be a library presentation without talking to you about databases. So databases. So databases are resources that we typically pay for. Um, we know that the information in them is accurate and reliable. They are vetted, they are looked at. Um, here at High Plains Library District, we, um, we subscribe to Consumer Health Complete, which is great. I don't use it as often as I would, I should. Um, it's just, it doesn't feel as, hand, as easily accessible to me for whatever reason. Um, Merck Manual, Merck Manual Consumer Edition used to be subscribed, but now it's available uh, for free online. And then another product is Gale. So Gale has Health and Wellness Resource Center, which is more consumer based, and then Gale Health Reference Center Academic for those more academic needs. Um, I think DPL has these too. Um, but they're great resources, they're there, and we pay for them. So use them. So now we're going to talk about the health resources online. So before we go anywhere, have any of you ever Googled your symptoms? So use your little chat box to, to confess or you don't need to confess <laughs> if, you don't, if you don't feel like you want to. 
So I got two yeses. So yes, we we are smart people and our patrons are smart people too, but we Google's so convenient and it's there. And I know that I have Googled my own symptoms and I know better, but I still do it. You know, it's the middle of the night. My kiddo's not feeling well. He has an earache, but not a fever. It doesn't feel right. I don't want to wait for the doctor. And yikes, I start Googling and it just kind of goes all over the place. And I end up more scared than I need to be. So why am I telling you not to use Google? So Google is awesome. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful tool for researching health. But the difference when you are researching health is the difference between knowing a known ailment and doing research for it and then not knowing a known ailment and trying to self-treat and diagnose. I don't recommend it. Um, it's like the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland. You start looking for health information on your headache and soon you're looking at one website, then you end up in some kind of chat room and it's just very confusing and it can really be anxious inducing. So don't do it. Okay. So we're going to move on to the next, so a little bit better, but not really is WebMD. So WebMD, have any of you used WebMD? So if you can put it on the chat. WebMD is a beautiful website with beautiful slides and um, it just presents information in a very, uh, very palatable way where you're like, oh, I want to learn about cancer and they have a slideshow. But why is it not good? Or why would I not recommend it? So according to the website, WebMD seeks out sponsorship in advertisements from relevant manufactured uh, manufacturers to provide health information. So it's really what they call advertorials. So they are seeking out um, manufacturers to help them in writing health information, which is then reviewed by a health expert. It is reviewed by a health expert, but it really is the, the whole purpose of this is to to sell something. So I like to give the example of sun care. So I was writing a little article for my senior uh, center newsletter on sun, on sun care. And I started looking at their beautiful slideshow and then and very slyly in the slideshow was a picture of this brand of sunscreen. And then alongside the website was also advertisement for that same sunscreen. So it's a very sneaky. Okay, so let's move on to the next set of resources online. So getting a little better, we have the hospital, the renowned hospital websites. So these hospitals mentioned here are known for treating certain ailments. So National Jewish is lung health. MD Anderson, world renowned for cancer care. Um, John Hopkins, so much great information coming out of John Hopkins. But why are hospital websites not as good as they could be? Well, hospitals may say that they're nonprofit, but some hospitals do publish. So they do publish. Um, I know I've, I've purchased a lot of books in the past from Mayo Clinic. They have these great books, but you'll be researching, let's say, cancer health, and then at the bottom, it'll give you a link to their book. So for me, the information doesn't feel completely unbiased. Okay, so getting a little bit better, we have health organization websites. Um, these health organization websites, um, the reason that we don't wholeheartedly um, suggest them is that they are committed to a specific cause, but they're, they're also publishers and they're also um, out there, they, they fundraise. So there's something to that. So again, not completely unbiased feeling, but great information, but it's also very specific to certain topics. Okay, so now getting a little bit better, better, we have government health agencies. So government health agencies, so here we have some great agencies. So Women, Infants and Children, WIC, uh, CDC, National Cancer Institute, the ChooseMyPlate.gov. So these are, um, I really like them because they are unbiased. They're not fundraising. Um, but the reason we don't wholeheartedly recommend them is that they're very specific. So for example, if you're a pregnant woman with cancer looking for information on how to take care of yourself, you wouldn't necessarily go to a website like WIC 
to address your cancer. But a good thing to note is that these websites have great downloadable resources. In the old days, you used to be able to order. The government publication office used to send you these boxes and it was like Christmas. You could get calendars and you could get rulers, but now there's no money left for that. But they do have great downloadable resources that you can print out if you're doing a program or if you're doing a display. Okay, so now drum roll. We move on to the best of the best is Medline Plus. So how many of you have heard of Medline Plus? So use your little chat box. Yay! I'm so glad to hear that you've heard of Medline Plus. So Medline Plus, I, I love, love Medline Plus. Medline Plus is a website put together by the National Library of Medicine and the National Institutes of Health. Um, and librarians uh, review it, they put all the material up there, and what it essentially is, it's like a, a giant database that filters your information. So if you are a pregnant woman with cancer who's looking for information, you would go to Medline Plus, you would search Medline Plus, and it would give it, it will give you information from websites that they have already vetted and made sure are reliable and up to date. They also have great materials for patrons. So they have materials in multiple languages. Um, they have a drug, herb, and supplement database. And this database is really great because it'll tell you if there's contradicting medicines that you're taking. They also have access to easy to read materials. Um, again, all the websites are reliable and up to date. And they have really cool videos, interactive tools. I could talk to you for a whole hour about Medline Plus, but I suggest that you just go to it. And for those really major large health topics, such as heart disease and diabetes, they have entire reports created on them that touch on all the medications, that have videos, tutorials, um, resources. So just a lot of great information on Medline Plus. So the next steps here. So I would like you to check out publiclibrary.health, a website. So this is a website that has been put together by the Public Library Association and the National Library of Medicine, and they are really trying to promote um, health in public libraries. And they have a really great newsletter that they send you every week with programming ideas and um, and news on what other libraries are doing. The second thing you need to do is that you need to find a health observance calendar. And I had given Christine a link to a um, to my handout, which has all these different um, uh, web links that you can access. So a health observance calendar, um, it tells you what the celebrations are on different months for different health issues. So, you know, there's National Heart Health Month, National Cancer Month, World AIDS Day, so that you can start thinking about programs um, related to those health observances. Um, if you have Facebook, the third thing I'd like you to do is that you should get connected with Libraries Are Champions of Healthy Communities Facebook group. So this is the publiclibrary.health Facebook group essentially. And again, tons of great programming ideas. And then I want you to get to know your regional medical library. So our regional medical library, there are seven in the nation and we are in the mid-continental region. They have a website and if you go to this website, it'll give you links to tons of trainings that are available to you. And here in Colorado, um, we have Dana Abbey as a contact and she is awesome. She can get you more information on Medline Plus and she can give you ideas on health programming. Um, so another great resource to have. Also, also as part of, um, a, of your National Libraries of Medicine and your regional library, they have a course called Stand Up for Health that I like to promote. It's a free online course specifically for public libraries that talks to you about how to get started, some public health information background for you, and when you complete this course, it's a four week course, you will get a certificate. You'll be a consumer health information specialist. Um, a little, you can put that, display that on your wall, but a great course. Okay, so now we're wrapping it up.
So we've talked about health disparities and how knowing those health disparities can help us in developing programming. Um, we've talked about programming and different resources that you can connect with in your community and then just finished up with some online resources. Um, so do you have any questions that I can answer now or did you want to share one thing that you that you learned? Anything. Yeah, so if anybody has any questions or other things that you guys are doing that you would like to share, um, it was great to kind of see the different programs you guys are offering. So if you once again have a unique partnership that you thought of or um, any other questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I did forget to mention at the beginning that um, Maggie's resources are actually available in Adobe Connect here. Um, if you just click on where it says Health Resources PDF, it can it will automatically download for you. It is also on the CSL in session website where the archive of today's session will be shortly and I will post that link here. Um, and Anne says that she plans to um, sign up for the um, the resources. <laughs> and my information is here. You can always free feel free to reach out to me. Um, I can send you pictures of events that sounded interesting or connect you with some of the local resources I have here, whatever you want. As people are typing, um, 